Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly, and I work with music and audio app developers to help them launch and build successful businesses on Google Play. We're really excited to be here today to share with you both technical and business best practices for developers that require high quality audio. So our session is divided into three parts. I'm first going to share with you tips from leading audio developers who have successfully built businesses on Android. Then Dawn is going to join me on stage to share common technical hurdles that audio developers face and ways to overcome them. Then Phil will be announcing our latest A-Audio framework that we think will help developers reach your performance needs. Then to wrap things up, we'll have Roland, uh, Roly CEO, join us on stage for a really cool live music demo. So stick around. So I grew up in Los Angeles, California, in a very musical family. And I remember the first time I stepped foot into a music studio. It was really exciting, but I was also a bit overwhelmed by the amount of professional tools and expensive equipment, and not to mention that renting the music studio itself wasn't exactly affordable. As a teenager, these DJ turntables were my favorite piece of equipment because I thought it was pretty cool being able to mix my favorite beats for my friends. But as cool as these turntables are, having access to expensive equipment or an expensive studio isn't really feasible for most people. So luckily, for the billions of people around the world who want to produce music, music creation has changed drastically. Now, with the accessibility of mobile, you can simply download an app and have pro-like quality music instrument and a music studio directly in your pocket, making these DJ turntables accessible to everyone on their phones. And that's why we've seen tremendous popularity in apps like EDJing with over 45 million installs, but of course, it's not just DJ apps that have grown in popularity. It's apps that allow you to sing karaoke, such as Smule Sing, with over uh, 52 million monthly active users, and apps like Chord Chaosolator that recently released on Android. And while high quality audio is important to music creation apps, it's also important to a whole host of other apps, such as VR or voice reliant apps or games. And the market for high quality audio apps is only expanding. So that's why I'd like to now dive deeper into the first part of our agenda, which is sharing with you three best practices from leading audio developers who have successfully launched and built their businesses on Google, Android. These best practices are launch smart, think global, and everyone's favorite, make more money. So first, launch smart. So we know that device fragmentation on Android can be a major challenge for developers that require a high performance audio. In order to deliver the best user experience, it's important to understand what device uh, work well for your performance needs. By performance here, I'm specifically talking about a device's CPU and latency. With the lower the latency, the better the user experience. So let's take a look now at how Joytunes, an app that requires low latency, approached launching on Android in order to maximize their reach but still achieve a good user experience. So Joytunes is uh, the creator of Simply Piano, a subscription-based music app that helps users learn how to play piano. In fact, my daughter here has learned how to play piano almost exclusively on this app. So we've had a piano in my household her entire life, and it wasn't until I introduced her to this app that she think that playing piano was all of a sudden fun. So what she does is she simply follows along um, to the guided lessons on our piano, and the app immediately recognizes what she's playing and then provides feedback to her to help her improve. So the key here is that when my daughter presses down on the piano keys, she expects that Simply Piano will immediately and accurately hear what she's playing and provide feedback. But in order to have this experience, Simply Piano requires low latency of playback and recording of musical tracks. So to figure out what devices meet their uh, low latency and computational performance needs, they first launched a beta version of their app in our Early Access collection. So Early Access is a collection on Google Play for new selected um, apps that are still in beta. Inclusion in this collection enabled Joytunes to build a beta audience and to be able to collect private user feedback. This enabled them to identify both problematic devices where users were having a poor quality uh, audio experience, but also problematic regions that they were then able to exclude from their production version. 
They also developed a way to have their app work on lower-end devices by making automatic adjustments of certain features, such as changing and optimizing the graphics so that a user on a particular device would still have a good experience. So with all of these learnings, Joytunes was able to then launch to a public audience with a very high user rating of over 4.3, and to also um, launch to a larger number of devices than they had originally thought possible. So second, you want to think global when you think about launching your app or growing your user base. And Android has tremendous strengths here. And we continue to see enormous growth of music creativity apps in both developed and emerging countries. When expanding to developing regions, though, you want to optimize your app for specific needs for users that are in that market. For instance, you may find that there's a higher number of users that are on low-end devices. And you may find that more users have lower bandwidth constraints. But as mentioned with Simply Piano, you don't have to limit your app to particular devices. There's a number of technical things that you can do to optimize your app for both high and low-end devices. So let's take a look now at another leading audio developer that has uh, been distributed globally but has seen enormous success in emerging markets. So Smule is a leading developer of mobile music apps, including Smule Sing, that allows users to sing along to their favorite songs in a karaoke-style fashion. So for instance, if I wanted to sing, or if any of you wanted to sing Disney Frozen's Let It Go, the app would match up what I am singing in real time with the song, and then I'd be able to overlay audio graphics to make my humble voice sound like a pop star. If Disney sing-alongs aren't popular in your household, they have a ton of other genres, too. So Smule has seen phenomenal growth. But last year, the app saw over 10x active user uh, install growth in the Southeast Asia region, with over 40% of their user base now comes from this region, with Indonesia being one of their fastest growing countries. But not only have they seen enormous active user install growth, they've also been monetizing well there. So with over 7x increase in revenue over the same year in the Southeast Asia region. So in addition to some of the technical optimizations that they've done, another reason for this viral uptick can be attributed to Smule offering locally relevant content. For instance, a user in Indonesia, pictured here on the left with the headphones, can sing along to one of the world's top hits, or she can choose to sing in a duet-style karaoke with one of her favorite regional artists, such as Sita, pictured on the right, who's a very popular Indonesian singer. So as you think about expanding your reach, you want to identify areas of growth and then create a localized experience for that market. I also encourage you to check out our Building for Billions guidelines online if you're interested in more tips on building for emerging markets. Lastly, you want to ensure that you're testing your monetization strategy to achieve the best business results. So many music creation apps have historically required that users pay a premium price in order to access their app. But because of the variety of payments that are available on mobile, user consumption habits have changed. And in fact, on Play, our fastest growing business model comes from subscriptions, where we've seen both subscribers and revenue double over the last year. So while the last two apps that I mentioned, Simply Piano and Smule, allow users to download the app for free and test it out and then sign up for a subscription, the developers of Ultimate Guitar Tabs have tested an interesting hybrid model. So Ultimate Guitar Tabs allows you to learn how to play guitar um, through in-app lessons, or you can just jam to your favorite song. So Ultimate Guitar started off as a premium app, but rather than charging a high price point, they experimented with a lower price point for a paid app, allowing users to download the app for $2.99, as you can see on the left. This essentially lowered the barrier to entry. Then they upsold their users once they were in the app, allowing them to download the full version for $9.99, as you can see on the right. So this hybrid approach of using paid and in-app purchases turned out to be an effective monetization model for Ultimate Guitar Tabs. They not only increased their revenue overall, but in-app purchases now account for 65% of their revenue, which is a pretty striking stat given they're already a premium app. So while a hybrid approach worked for them, I encourage you to test out different monetization models beyond premium and see where you have the best conversion results. So these are just a few examples of audio de developers that are seeing tremendous success on Android. Uh, there's a tremendous appetite for music creativity apps, 
And so we think if you follow the business tips that I just um, gave and also some of the technical tips that Don and Phil will be sharing, that there's a big opportunity for developers in this space. I would now like to introduce Don to the stage to discuss common technical hurdles and how developers can overcome them. Thank you. Hello, hello. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, hi, I'm Don. I'm a developer advocate, and I lead our developer efforts uh, for the Android High Performance Audio Framework. What that means is I help you guys create amazing audio experiences on Android. What it actually means is I spend virtually all my time listening to sine waves. Um, outside of Google, I do a bit of DJing. And in my head, I like to DJ in places like this. But the reality is actually probably closer to this. More people def definitely turned up later, I promise. Um, OK, so today I'm going to give you two best practices which you can use in your apps to create amazing audio experiences. These are. Obtain low latency audio paths and meet your audio deadlines so you don't give your users headaches by uh, putting audio glitches into their ears. So, uh, so starting with obtain low latency paths, I'm going to talk about two signal paths through the, sig through, through the Android system. Uh, number one, recording, and number two, playback. Now, one of the first questions that I often get from developers is, what is the latency of this path? And this is the thinking behind the audio.pro hardware feature flag. And if a device reports support for this flag, it means that this particular path is less than 20 milliseconds uh, over the headset. You can use this flag in your app to either enable certain features, such as live monitoring, or you can only distribute to these devices, these pro audio devices. And there's now tens of devices in market which are supporting this particular standard. So it's not just Pixel and Nexus devices. We're seeing good uptake from OEMs as well. So <clears throat> audio recording. This is the path through the Android audio framework when you're recording. Uh, you have an analog signal into a microphone, goes through an analog to digital converter, um, through some effects to kind of clean up the signal. Uh, this can be things like noise cancellation and echo cancellation. And then the digital data is delivered to your app. Now, effects can add latency. So if, if we're talking about low latency apps, what we want is the lowest possible latency. And there is a, a route through the system which allows us to avoid adding this latency. And this is obtained using the voice recognition preset. The other thing we need to remember here is to use PCM16 format. And this uh, essentially allows the audio framework to not do any format shifting, which potentially could add latency. So that's all I'm going to say about audio recording. <clears throat> audio playback is a, a little bit more complicated. So every phone that produces audio in the world has a digital to analog converter in it. This takes ones and noughts and converts it into a voltage, uh, which is used to drive uh, headphones or a speaker. Um, now, I like to think of this as kind of a character which is chomping down on this audio data and producing a signal. In fact, I even have a name for him, Dakman. Now, Dakman has very specific requirements for his food. He wants it served to him at a certain rate. And he also wants it served to him in bite-sized chunks of a very specific size. Now, for this analogy to work, Dakman also includes a DMA controller and all the other hardware required to consume audio. So just bear with it. So this is how Dakman fits in to the uh, Android audio architecture. So your app is at the top here. And it's your job to get your audio data to the, uh, the output as quickly as possible. The default path through the system is to go through a resampler, through some effects, again, to improve the acoustic quality of the signal, and then through a mixer and out to Dakman. Now, as with the recording path, the resampler and effects will add latency. And we can obtain a lower latency path called the fast mixer path if our app conforms to certain requirements. So <clears throat> number one. Uh, 
we need to obtain the correct sample rate. So remember I said Dakman wants his food at a specific rate. We can use the Audio Manager API to find out exactly what that rate is. And that will enable us to create uh, an audio stream on this fast path. The other thing we need to remember is not to add any effects. So once we've created this uh, audio stream to Dakman, we need to start supplying audio data. And we need to do it in this uh, specific chunk size. And again, we can use the Audio Manager API to obtain this optimal size. So after this first chunk of audio data is consumed by Dakman, he sends us a callback. He's basically saying, I've run out of food. Feed me more. And we get this callback on a high priority thread. And this allows you to do your audio processing work without being preempted by other parts of the system. Now, this is a fairly critical part of any audio app. So let's take a closer look at what happens inside this callback. So every callback has a deadline. Remember that you have to send these chunks of audio data at very specific intervals. So the amount of time you spend in this, this callback is going to vary based on the computations that you're performing, like the complexity of the, the audio data, but also CPU frequency and you know, the device that you're running on. If you miss this deadline, Dakman is going to be very unhappy, and he's going to output silence in protest. Um, so it's very important that we don't miss these deadlines. So for the next part, I wanted to talk about some common reasons why you might miss these audio deadlines. So starting with blocking. So inside your callback, there are various reasons you might block. And here I have uh, a code sample which does a whole lot of bad things, things you shouldn't do in your callback. So number one, logging. Um, instead of logging inside the callback, you should use a trace and use sysTrace. It's a much better tool for, for debugging the callback. Don't do memory allocation. Um, if you need to use memory inside the callback, which invariably you do, uh, you should allocate the memory up front when you instantiate your audio stream and then just use it inside here rather than trying to allocate new memory. Um, don't wait on other threads. Bear in mind, you, this is a high priority callback. So if you're waiting on a lower priority thread, you have priority inversion. Don't do file I.O. Uh, if you need to read from a file, use another thread and then use a non-blocking queue or a circular buffer to transfer data into the callback. And don't sleep. There should never be any need to sleep inside here. So, so we've dealt with blocking. Um, the next reason why, why you might miss your deadlines is core migrations. Now, when you create an audio app on Android, the CPU scheduler will assign your audio thread to a particular core. And here, here I have a sysTrace, um, which is showing the audio thread running on CPU 1. And we have four callbacks marked in the, those green rectangles there are the callbacks. The other row of interest is fready1 here, which shows us the state of our audio buffer. Um, and we have four callbacks. And then the CPU scheduler shifts our thread over C to CPU 0. Now, this core migration can incur a slight time penalty in the order of a few milliseconds. And this can cause our callback to start late and therefore run over. And sure enough, we have an audio glitch occurring there. So, um, the solution to this is to set thread affinity, which means that we can bind our audio thread either to the current uh, core which we're assigned. Uh, that's like an OK way of doing it. Or we can use get exclusive cores on API 24 or above <coughs> in order to uh, get the cores which are reserved for the current foreground application. Right, lastly, CPU frequency scaling. So this is a process which is used to give users great performance and great battery. It's like a power performance trade-off. CPU frequency is high when users need good performance and low when they don't need good performance, but they do want to conserve power. So this is great for most applications, but for real-time audio applications, it can cause a problem. So imagine you have a synthesizer app. And every, every time you press a key, the synthesizer app generates a voice. Uh, this is how the computational graph might look for an app like this. So we start off, we have 10 fingers down on our keyboard. And at the, our 
app bandwidth required is fairly high. Now we take our fingers off that keyboard. Our bandwidth required drops down, and the CPU governor sees that actually our app doesn't need as much bandwidth, so it drops down the CPU frequency. Everything's fine so far. Now we put our fingers back on the keyboard. So our bandwidth rises to its previous level, but the governor takes a while to ramp the CPU frequency back up to the level that we need. So unfortunately, during this time, glitches are occurring. So the solution to this, well, this, the title of this talk is Best Practices for Android Audio. But for this section alone, let's just call this Don's Practices for Android Audio. Um, and this is from working with top partners like Raleigh. This is what actually works in the real world. Um, so what you can do is you can use something called stabilizing load. Now, the idea here is that instead of having a varying, a varying amount of time spent in your callback, you have a fixed amount of time. And this stabilizing load can be things like gating voices on and off, or you can use uh, assembler no operation instructions, basically to keep the CPU spinning. Um, so the, um, the result of that is that you basically have fixed load, fixed CPU frequency, and you always have the bandwidth you require in order to generate audio data. This is best used with sustained performance mode on API 24, as this will avoid you running into thermal throttling issues. Um, so in summary, obtain low latency audio and always meet your audio deadlines. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to Phil, who's going to talk about a fantastic new audio API in Android. Welcome, Phil. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Phil Burke, and I work in the Android audio group, uh, mostly on MIDI and Pro Audio uh, applications. My background is in experimental music, so my personal goal is to make the Android platform really a great platform for making strange kinds of new musical instruments. So that's sort of what motivates me. Um, the, what I'll be talking about is a new audio API called A-Audio, which we're very excited about. And then I'll show you how to do callbacks using that API. And then I'll also show you how to optimize your latency um, on any particular device you happen to be running. So A-Audio is a C API. So this is a native uh, API. You may be wondering why a new API. We already have OpenSLES and Java. And the reason is that um, A-Audio is, we think, easier to use. And if you've done, used OpenSLES and compare them, I think you'll see why. Also, the, uh, it's a platform where we can make improvements. And um, this will show you how we do that. The, these three APIs um, can all go through the existing Audio Flinger framework. Uh, but if we make radical changes in the audio flinger, we potentially could break thousands of apps that are already existing. So what we do is we add a new A audio service where we can do some pretty radical things and not have to worry about breaking existing stuff. So we can do some uh, big performance enhancements in the A audio service. So A audio uses the concept of streams, audio flowing from the mic to the app, back down to the headphones. So how do you create a stream using A audio? We use a builder design pattern. So in the builder, you can set your parameters that you want. You could leave everything just the default, and you'll probably get a stereo output stream. But if you need a specific sample rate or a specific format, you can set that. Once the builder is set up, you can use it like a rubber stamp to create multiple streams. So this is what it looks like in the code. So we have a audio, create stream builder, pretty straightforward. And if you want, here's how you set different parameters on the stream builder. Once you've set up the stream, you call audio stream builder open stream. Again, pretty straightforward. And then if you didn't specify things like the sample rate or the format, then you'll need to query it to find out what you got. Don't just assume that it's 48,000 hertz, because some devices, uh, particularly like USB devices, it might be at 96,000 hertz or you know, something. So it's important to query to find out what you really got after you open the stream. Another important value is this frames per burst. And this correlates with the chunk sizes that uh, DACMAN was consuming in Don's slides. So what is a burst versus what is a buffer? There's, 
this can be very confusing. So um, when we say buffer in A-Audio, we're talking about the whole array where the audio data is stored for a particular stream. And in that buffer, there can be multiple bursts. So in this case, Stackman has two bursts that it can consume, and we're writing in uh, uh, the size of a burst. You have to start your stream. Um, you can pause it. You can flush the stream, stop it. These are asynchronous calls. And normally, you don't have to worry about that. But if you have to synchronize, we do have a function that will allow you to synchronize with a state machine inside A-Audio. The um, reading and writing. So we have to get data in and out of these streams. So there's two ways. If, if your application doesn't need super low latency, uh, the easiest thing is just to read or write using blocking writes. And uh, so here we're in a loop, and we're doing a write. And you notice we have a timeout there uh, as a last parameter. Uh, when we do a blocking write, we'll get back either an error code or the number of frames written. And if it times out or if we use a timeout of 0, uh, it may not be, we, we may get a partial transfer. OK, the second technique is when you need uh, the lowest latency. And to do that, you'd need a high priority thread that may be running with a SCED FIFO uh, scheduler and hopefully at a higher priority as well. So the way to do that is to write your own callback function. So this is a, a, pro, a function that you would write. And we, uh, A Audio will pass to you a stream parameter, a user data, which could be an object or a, a structure pointer. Uh, and then audio data pointer, which is a pointer to your array and the number of frames. And then you can render directly into that audio buffer and then return. Once you have a defined your callback function and you know what data you want to pass, you give it to the builder. You set the data callback on the builder. And then when you later create a stream, it will use those values. Uh, sometimes people need to combine multiple inputs. Maybe you're taking two input sources and mixing them and sending them to an output. So how, what's the best way to do that with A-Audio? We recommend using one stream as a master and doing your callback from that master stream, uh, which ideally should be an output stream. And then what you do in the callback, see here we're being past the uh, output stream pointer. So what we do in the callback is we do a read from the input stream, and we set the timeout to 0. So this is a non-blocking call. As Don mentioned, you don't want to block inside the callback. Now, initially, you may not get all the data that you're expecting. But pretty soon, these two streams will synchronize like very quickly within a couple buffer calls. And then you'll have nice back and forth between these two streams. And you can um, uh, do echo or gu guitar effects, things like that. Uh, the other topic I want to discuss is uh, dynamic latency tuning. So if you, um, it's very difficult to predict ahead of time what the exact number of buffers that you need. And the number of buffers determines your latency. If you have too few buffers, or, uh, too few bursts, I guess, in your buffer, um, then if, you, if your thread is preempted, you may glitch. So what you want to do, uh, if you look at this diagram from before, Right now, we only have two bursts that are valid in this very large buffer. So that's our latency is, is two times this burst for, for this buffer. So if, the, if we are unable to write to the buffer, uh, DACMAN will run out of, of data after two bursts. So if we have a glitch, we may wish that we um, have three bursts in the buffer so we have a little bit more cushion if we get preempted, if our thread gets preempted. So we can adjust this value. Uh, the way you do that in code, is that you can query to find out how many overruns or underruns you've had on that uh, output stream. And if it's changed since the last time you checked, that means that you just had a glitch. So what you can then do is you can query to see um, what the size is of, of the buffer, um, how much, basically how much of the buffer is being used, which determines your latency, and then bump it up and say, well, let's just add one more burst in here. So instead of being double buffered, I'll be triple buffered. And then you set that back in, uh, to reset your size. So this is a sort of a simplification. Uh, you may find that you want to, you know, if you could do timing analysis and maybe lower the latency again later if you haven't glitched for a long time. But that's up to the application to do those those kind of smart 
smart analysis. But this is the basic technique. So in summary, to uh, a minimal A audio program, you create a builder, uh, you open a stream, you start the stream, and then in a loop, uh, this case we're doing the, the blocking writes, synthesizing audio and writing it to the stream, and then we close it when we're done. So pretty simple. Uh, just for comparison, this is sort of an equivalent OpenSLES program. Uh, it's probably a little hard to read, but um, uh, as you can see, the A audio is uh, fewer lines of code, a little more straightforward if you want to uh, use audio. So uh, now A audio, you're probably thinking that sounds great, but it's only in the O release. So how does that help me if I'm writing for Marshmallow or Nougat or Lollipop? So what we're doing is we're developing a wrapper which has um, is basically like the A audio API and A audio features, um, but uh, it's in C++, so it just looks slightly different. And what we do is we dynamically link to the A audio library uh, using runtime linking. So your program can run and link on previous versions of, uh, of Android, but A audio won't be there. And so then what we do is we just dynamically switch over to using OpenSLES. So if you write your program to this new API, which uh, will be like an open source thing, where it's uh, not quite out yet, but it will be out soon. Um, then uh, if you write your program to this C++, C++ wrapper, then you'll be able to use A audio or OpenSLES transparently and run on older new platforms. OK, uh, I'm excited about what's coming up next. Uh, this is, uh, Roly is going to give us a demo. And uh, Roly is a company that's been taking advantage of a lot of these tricks. Uh, they, they've figured out a lot of stuff, and they've been a great partner for us. So I'd like uh, C their CEO of Roly, Roland Lamb, to come up and uh, give us a talk about some of the programs they've been de developing on Android. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. As uh, Phil was saying, I'm Roland Lamb. I'm the founder and CEO of Roly, um, a company that is developing new musical hardware and software. Um, and I'm very pleased to have uh, Marco and Jack Parisi with me, who are virtuoso musicians who are kind of on this cutting edge of uh, new hardware, new software, and expression. So um, just to give a little bit of background, uh, you know, starting out, I, I felt really passionate about creativity and about um, you know the joy that comes from creation. Um, and in particular, we thought we want to empower everyone to be creators, but particularly in music. And the reason for music being kind of the center point for us um, is that there's this huge opportunity for expression that is untapped. And the way we think about that is that musical instruments are tremendously expressive, but they're still quite difficult to learn. Um, and on the other side, electronic music has such versatility associated with it, but then it's relatively technical still and complicated to set up your own home studio. So we thought, what if we could create instruments that were deeply expressive, but also easy to learn, had the versatility of electronic music, um, but then didn't have all of the extra technical setup? But to solve that problem, we thought, first of all, we need these high resolution control devices for digital. So, you know, we couldn't, it, if you just have like simple one dimensional electronic controllers, you can't get to that depth of expression that you have with all of the physical gestures you can create with acoustic instruments. So um, I invented this instrument called the Seaboard. And the Seaboard is an evolution of the piano keyboard. You can play it just the way that you play a piano. But then you can modulate all of the sounds in real time using very intuitive gestures. So as Marco will show, um, you, could, you could play the Seaboard, first of all, just like a piano. I think uh, maybe if the guys can bring up the audio. Sounds like maybe they just did, Marco. Um, so uh, we're running the Seaboard now on um, Pixel. Take it. So it's kind of like electronic piano patch. He's just playing it like a piano. But if he wants to, he could play it, for example, like a guitar. And uh, he would just you know, be able to bend these um, soft silicon keys left to right, as you'll see.
So those kinds of bends that you know, usually you would associate with, a, with another kind of acoustic instrument you can create in this context. And there's many, many sonic possibilities uh, with something like the Seaboard. So we thought, wow, this is awesome. We have this new physical technology, but we want to make it as accessible as possible you know, to reach many, many more people around the world. Um, so we built a new product called Blox. And Blox takes uh, the technology of the Seaboard and puts it into a format um, of a small, like, pocket size music controller um, and you can you see you see it there you can use it to just play beats or e play expressive melodies and when we launched blocks uh, we initially um, launched on iOS um, but the idea was always to make it you know go far and wide and so um, the the issue for us was really about the latency all the stuff that Don and Phil have been talking about because to power these new expressive instruments, we developed um, a professional-grade synthesizer called Equator. And with Equator, um, you know, you're running many, many um, different channels of synthesis at the same time, and you're controlling them with all of these different multi-parameter gestures. This is, it's a professional um, audio application that's used in studios all around the world. So to run that on a phone, you know, we, we had to do quite a bit of work. But the recent developments uh, in the last few versions of Android have made a big difference. And all of the you know, stuff that's just been discussed um, has actually made it so um, now we can run all the sounds in Equator on Android devices. Noise, the application, is available in early access in the Google Play Store. And Marco and Jack, some of you may have noticed, opened up Google I.O. two days ago with a performance that was performed just on four pixel phones. So um, they're going to just play a minute from that. Um, so it's um, Seaboard plus blocks plus um, four pixel phones, three instances of noise, and um, they're also using DJ Pro 2. So let's take a look. Thank you so much. So one of the reasons why we were able to do this um, was that we develop a coding framework called Juice, J-U-C-E. Um, and it's a C++ cross-platform framework um, that's built for audio. And it's really built for speed. Um, and so we've been working not only you know, using Juice for noise, but uh, we work with thousands of developers around the world um, who are creating audio applications that are cross-platform. And what we're finding is with these recent improvements um, in Android, it's not just you know, for our applications, but for many of our developers, they can take applications that were audio applications that were developed for iOS, for example, and now port those over um, to Android. And we're also seeing this is an interesting opportunity for a lot of other developers out there who want to create low latency audio applications but don't necessarily have the resources to um, learn all of the different systems associated with the different platforms. So that's something to check out if you're interested at juice.com. We also organize something called ADC, um, not the ADC that um, Phil uh, was talking about, but it's called Audio Developer Conference in London, um, which is on the 13th and 15th of November, which is, uh, deals with all of these issues. So um, check that out at juice.com. But um, just you know, thank you for uh, tuning in. And we thought we'd leave you with one more little performance um, from Marco and Jack.
So Marco and Jack Parisi, everyone, and also check out, um, check out their work. Parisi is doing some amazing things and releasing some great work. So I believe that's all for this session. And there's a sandbox uh, that will follow. Um, so uh, you know, come check it out. And um, thank you all so very much for coming today.